Latin American and European heads of state met recently in Brussels and there was a lot on the agenda. At the same time, there was also a meeting of people's organizations, which had, of course, a more radical agenda. What were the issues discussed? Political chaos has break, broken out in Thailand as the leading prime ministerial candidate has been temporarily suspended from parliament. What lies ahead for this embattled country? We'll be addressing these questions and more in this episode of Daily Debrief. We first go to Brussels, which over the past few days hosted the CELAC EU Heads of State Summit, the first time the forum was meeting since 2015. The meeting took place at a time of great global churn, as all of you know, with the two regions on very different political trajectories. And now this was reflected in some of the moves by the EU ahead of the conference. For instance, the EU Parliament passed a resolution against Cuba, and this was widely condemned by many Latin American countries. Meanwhile, a parallel People's Summit was also held, attended by over 1,000 progressive thousand delegates from progressive organizations across the continents. The summit discussed many of the issues that clearly did not figure in the Heads of State Summit. And to understand more about this, we have with us Zoe Alexandra, who's right now in Brussels and covered these summits. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. So usually, of course, we talk about the Heads of State, but I think today we'll uh, do something different, talk about the People's Summit first. So could you tell us what was on the agenda at this People's Summit? Because uh, I think this uh, People's Summit also taking place amid some minor tensions regarding regarding you know, how parallel forums were organized. So this People's Summit had a very different agenda, it seems like. So could you tell us a bit about that? That's exactly right. Uh, this, uh, the People's Summit was organized by a coalition of over 100 uh, movements, trade unions, left parties uh, from across Latin America and the Caribbean and in Europe. Um, it was a, a true testament to the diversity of people's struggles um, from both sides, uh, from both regions, um, with a heavy emphasis on really combating uh, the historical legacy of colonialism and of imperialism that characterizes the relationship between Europe and Latin America. We're not talking about two regions that have had a interaction that has always been amicable. Um, this is, uh, you know, the European powers colonized Latin America and the Caribbean continue to uh, carry out imperialist attacks against many of the countries in the region. And so this People's Summit uh, was a chance for the peoples to come together um, to really uh, debate some of these key issues. Um, for example, the blockade against Cuba it was a huge um, topic that was debated. Uh, the EU does not currently have sanctions against Cuba. However, they just passed a resolution in the European Parliament uh, that called for the EU to impose sanctions on Miguel Diaz-Canel and, and, you know, passed wording uh, and statements that were very, very, very sharply condemning Cuba's position, even called for Cuba to not be invited to the CELAC EU summit. So it's clear that there are still, uh, the EU still represents um, a block that is in play. It's not defined one way or another, but as right-wing forces are growing in the region, uh, it is crucial that there is a people-to-people -people dialogue and that can, there can be pressure um, from within Europe against their governments to stop um, many of these uh, imperialist attacks against Latin America and imperialist policies. Uh, we know that there's a lot of European interest in Latin America from uh, big corporations, many of the largest mining companies that today are present across Latin America and the Caribbean are stationed in Europe, have European capital. Uh, and so really a lot of these issues were brought to the table, especially uh, also um, the, the blockade and sanctions against Venezuela, which Europe has played a huge role. If they're not doing it in Cuba, they're definitely in Venezuela, um, European countries, uh, and the EU itself has imposed sanctions against members of the Venezuelan government, which they say does not actually target the Venezuelan people. But we know that these sanctions, even if they're targeted sanctions, have so many secondary uh, effects on the people, the ability for governments to actually engage in normal political and financial and economic transactions with other nations. Um, so all of these were really key, key issues and also ratifying the CELAC commitment um, to Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace. This has been a historic commitment um, from this regional space, which uh, grew to prominence and was founded during the first progressive wave uh, by Hugo Chavez with the impulse of uh, Lula da Silva and the other progressive leaders 
in the region at that time has once again uh, gained this prominence in Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's showing with this EU CELAC summit as well um, that it is a key player. And so um, in the 2014 CELAC summit, they declared Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace. And so this has many implications, not only for the internal conflicts uh, that are taking place in several countries across the region, but also um, demanding that imperialist forces do not use the region as a zone of conflict in an attempt to carry out their own uh, warmongering plans. So a uh, very vibrant discussion and debate, um, large delegations that came from Cuba, Venezuela, Bolivia, Peru, uh, all bringing uh, to the fore their struggles in their countries for sovereignty, for dignity, um, for true freedom and independence, um, and for greater regional uh, integration. Absolutely interesting, Zoe, because it does seem like the People's Summit really foregrounding imperialism as a key topic, which often you do not see in many of these global forums and discussions. But now let's go to the uh, official summit, the uh, EU head, the EU CELAC Heads of State Summit. And like we said, the continents right now in very different spaces, so to speak, politically. Europe, of course, facing a right-wing resurgence. In Latin America, the right-wing is still strong, but we're also seeing progressive governments. So what was the mood like at this summit and what were the kind of results or conclusions that came out? Well, it's it's pretty interesting because, um, as I said, the relationship between Latin America and Europe has been one that's characterized by domination, by uh, this sense of superiority of, of Europe and many uh, Latin American leaders actually commented in the summit that it's Europe that is uh, in need of a saving hands from Latin America, not only in the sense of uh, resources and raw materials. Europe isn't currently in an extreme energy crisis, does not have um, putting sanctions on Russia is left in a very vulnerable position. Latin America is essentially the future of all clean energy in terms of uh, the resources that it possesses, but not only because of the resources that Latin America has, but also because of um, the strong movements that it's been able to build, uh, the moral force of its leaders currently. Um, it is, as you said, Europe is is sort of sliding back towards the far right and towards authoritarianism, uh, is unable to establish its own independent foreign policy. Uh, the U.S. essentially dominates um, so much of what gets said in Europe at their at their forums. Uh, and what's interesting is that Latin America actually coming to this space and saying, you might be dominated by the U.S., but we are not. And so one of the major sticking points in this summit, despite actually being completely external to any of the main issues that the people that uh, the two regions were discussing, was the war in Ukraine and the European bloc. Surely, from some impetus from the United States, uh, really came in with the agenda that they wanted to push a clause on the final statement um, that would condemn Russia and support Ukraine in its war efforts. And this, before the summit, had been a huge point. Um, from Latin American leaders to say, no, we're not going to accept this kind of imposition of the agenda. This doesn't even have to do with the issues that we're trying to discuss, which are economic cooperation, which are agreements with the Mercosur uh, European Union agreement. Um, and this was coming into the summit. This was a huge point. And even during the summit, um, we heard that there was a really, really long delay in even finishing the final statement because several European countries we're pushing for this uh, statement condemning Russia. And finally, the, the will and the determination of Latin America to have an independent foreign policy that's about non-interference, non-alignment, and not trying to um, really get involved in a war that's Europe's. And so this was uh, quite uh, powerful. Many of the leaders that actually even came to speak at the People's Summit, including Luis Arce, including Delcy Rodriguez, the Venezuelan vice president, really emphasized that uh, it's their right as sovereign nations to not have to have, uh, to not take the stance of the United States, to not take the stance of the European Union. And so I think that in this sense, they really uh, showed and they gave the example that uh, it's actually possible to exist independently of the United States and that Latin America has faced and is willing to face the consequences of that. Currently, Europe, it has a lot to lose from this. And this is something Gustavo Petro emphasized a lot, um, that when you have a lot to lose, it's a lot harder to make these choices. Latin America is already in such a difficult position. It's faced so much over the past decade, over the past decades, historically over the past 500 years with colonialism. And so they are willing to forge their own path 
to try to create a new system, to try to try to create new paradigms. And Europe still seems stuck in this system where they're unable to really uh, challenge the U.S. interests uh, and really do what's best for their own people. And this is the key issue is that Europe is sacrificing its own people for U.S. interests. And so I think uh, it was quite an interesting summit in that sense. There was also meetings held, bilateral meetings, um, between the Venezuelan opposition and the Venezuelan government. This was also attended by uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, Brazilian President uh, Lula da Silva, Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez. So really interesting movements happening. CELAC, once again, is really showing its might. It's showing its strength and showing that it is really the voice of Latin America. I think the OAS is at this point such an artifact of the past, an artifact of imperialist and attempts to dominate the region, and it has completely failed. CELAC is clearly uh, what is forging the path for the future. Interesting, Zoe. It looks like Latin America once again fighting off the Monroe Doctrine, even as Europe is implementing its own version of that. Thank you so much for talking to us. We'll come back to you with maybe some of the conclusions of this summit, some of the longer-term implications another day. We now go to Thailand, where chaos has broken out in the political sphere after Peter Limjaran Rat, the leader of the Move Forward Party, was temporarily suspended from parliament by a court. Now, the party is the single largest in the Thai lower house of parliament, and Peter was the leading candidate to become the prime minister. Now, his candidature was, of course, not warmly received by the ruling military monarchy establishment, and there had been speculation for a while that he would be disqualified. And promptly on the day of the second vote to elect a prime minister, the constitutional court ordered his suspension pending a final ruling. Subsequently, the parliament has broken, blocked Peter from running as for PM as well. Now, this is a developing story. There might be a lot of changes happening by the time you see this video. But currently, to make sense of these developments, we go to Anish. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, we have been tracking the story for quite some time. And, uh, you know, you had, I think, earlier talked about when the last vote took place, you had talked about the fact that, you know, Peter had tried to form a majority, he was not able to. But, and you had also, I think, mentioned that there was this case looming uh, in front of him. But this is really a dramatic development. So, could you first take us through what has happened on uh, Wednesday in Thailand and also a bit about the case? Yeah, dramatic uh, is a mild way to put it, actually, uh, considering how things uh, went down. Uh, we had the parliament session happening, and I think less than an hour into the session, there was already the constitutional court, uh, uh, you know, handing down the order to suspend him as a legislator. And uh, the fact that, uh, and he obviously, Peter had to receive that order while he was sitting in parliament in uh, in the joint session uh, while he was being voted for the prime minister obviously these developments uh, while dramatic obviously uh, was not uh, unexpected because we have seen this happen multiple times over and over again i mean the, it's pretty much a rule book at this point you have a prominent uh, anti militarist uh, candidate uh, either forming a government or close to forming a government and there are new rules being written down now, the case is quite significant to, uh, because on the one hand, obviously, even with the suspension, suspension, he was qualified to stand for the post of the prime minister. Uh, but what happened was uh, the, the, the senators, which is pretty much uh, uh, military appointees at this point, uh, most of them appointed during the junta was in part, and uh, the pro-royalist and the pro-military factions within the lower house, who was a minority, uh, pretty much argued that uh, the motion, like they argued that the motion to, uh, uh, to for the candidacy can only be filed once by a candidate. And uh, that sort of, uh, and now what happened today was a vote of whether or not he can stand because he already failed the vote last week. And so uh, they decided that he, uh, he is not qualified to stand again because the motion was already uh, defeated in the current session. Now, that kind of sets a precedent of uh, how a prime minister can be uh, elected in the near future even. And that also sets a precedent for maybe another set of prime ministers because uh, after the MFP, uh, the Move Forward Party, which only had one uh, prime ministerial candidate uh, filed during the electoral process, uh, it now goes to the hat now goes to Kuwaitai, which is the second largest party in the parliament. And also the second largest party within the eight party coalition that was trying to form a government. And uh, they obviously have three candidates, but uh, the question is, it kind of sets a precedent of 
what the militarist establishment wants. Nish, by precedent and in this context, you mean that uh, it is uh, it, it is not usual that if a candidate fails to become the prime minister once he or she doesn't get a second chance. Exactly, exactly. And so this that is the first time much, they've, they've made up that rule pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. They just uh, interpreted it in that manner. And and pretty much this this is not something new. We have seen in the past uh, okay. in an election, they try to pretty much uh, change the laws of who gets elected as well. But that's a different story. But yeah, uh, in this current scenario, what happens is that the Koyitai will have one, two or maybe three chance uh, of uh, like, uh, trying to get a part, uh, prime minister elected. And if that fails, pretty much it goes to the military. So they have set the tone of what they expect. And they want uh, do not want, obviously, the MFP to uh, be in power at any point in time. Right. Of course, also remind viewers that uh, the current vote that is taking place for the position of Prime Minister involves members from both houses. And while, uh, you know, move forward in Pyutai, for instance, I, like you said, the eight-party coalition has a majority in the lower house of parliament. The Senate is almost entirely controlled by members appointed by the military and the establishment. So, uh, overall, they seem to have a lead. Uh, but, Anish, could you tell us a bit about what the case against Pita is in this context as well? Because uh, I think he has a potential of appealing, like you said. But what is the reason he was temporarily suspended by the court? The reason is basically that the case has been accepted and uh, that until there is a judgment on the case, he will be uh, suspended from uh, following any of the duties of the, that is the court, like uh, the duties of the, as a lawmaker. So he pretty much cannot, can sit maybe, uh, but uh, we are also not sure about that. The whole thing, basically it's going, uh, it, the kind of manner in which the whole system works uh, right now, when it comes to uh, dealing with opposition candidates, pretty much you make the rules as you go. So right now there is one case against Pita, which is uh, which might if it uh, goes against him, obviously he gets disqualified as uh, a parliamentarian. But and probably even at uh, the worst case scenario would be that he will be banned from uh, politics, active politics for the next ten years, which has happened again in the past. And uh, there is another case which is far more significant, which is about move forward party. Uh, against the Move Forward Party and the campaign promise to amend the the lesser majesty law, which is the royal defamation uh, law, which which has been uh, at the center of uh, you know Thai politics for past several years, and even was the reason why Peter was defeated at this point. And in that case, uh, the court is going to judge whether or not even calling for an amendment of the law is going against the monarchy. Or uh, you know, uh, calling uh, you know, trying to uh, attack the monarchy. So that kind of judgment is going to be far more significant because it's, obviously it will dissolve the move forward party forcibly, but it will also affect civil rights as well as a whole in Thailand and pretty much gives the monarchy a unprecedented set of powers and rights that uh, cannot really uh, you know sustainably stay with any kind of democratic system. In that uh, in the current situation, so pretty much we are going into that territory where even calling for a law that very vaguely deals with the monarchy can be, can be deemed as an attack on the monarchy, and that is pretty much the direction that the uh, the Thai establishment right now is going towards. Absolutely, right. and uh, Anish, of course, uh, uh, Peter's agenda. Uh, there, of course, a lot of uncertainty around his real agenda, his approach to foreign affairs. These are issues we have noted in the past as well. And a, a very wide and diverse set of supporters, uh, including various influences. Uh, but I think it's an, uh, significant to note that for a big country like Thailand, this kind of chaos is definitely not likely to have positive impact. And, you know, really kind of um, poses, I think, questions about democracy itself. Thank you so much for talking to us. And I suspect we'll be coming back to this topic in Thailand uh, in future episodes as well. And we'll be following very similar issues in future episodes. So do go to YouTube, watch Daily Debrief every day. Also visit our website peoplesdispatch.org, all our social media platforms and keep following us.